In September of 2014, there was going to be climate talks under the uh, banner, I guess, you know, or the oversight of the United Nations in New York City. Again, um, politicos coming together to talk, and guess who was at the table talking with them? The big polluters, and not people like you, or you, or me, no one uh, of the 99% were there. We're already going through species wipeout, and it's all due because of CO2 emissions, methane, etc. You know, the environmental problems are across the board. It's not just to do with oil and fossil fuels. We've seen in Canada the destruction of the fisheries in the oceans off both coasts, especially off the East Coast, because of capitalist greed. And we've been suffering, the forests of Canada have been suffering from overcutting and other forms of abuse long before even global warming came along. Global warming is now accelerating it. We've lost the pine forests, or we're in the process of losing the pine forests of all of Western North America, because the winter, the cold winter temperatures don't kill the mountain pine beetle anymore like they used to. So there it is. What we're confronting, though, is an acceleration of the, of the global warming emergency. Uh, it's getting worse, not better. Despite all that science is telling us, and even uh, despite some of the arguments that are made by proponents of capitalism saying that we should just retire the fossil fuel industry and move on to other profitable forms of green investment, as it's called, um, the, uh, the oil industry is just not listening to that message. They're, they will burn every last drop of oil on Earth if they can make money off of it, and to hell with the environment and the rest. So, I mean, that's, um, you know, that's part of what we're up against. Major corporations are the ones who are destroying, knowingly destroying the planet, which also means knowingly destroying communities, nations, ecosystems. Last year I was on the steering committee for system change on climate change, and our big focus was for to, to prepare for this sham at the United Nations. And that's where the idea of developing the climate convergence came up. And there were other organizations that were involved. Um, of course, there was the big march. Because it was a, it was a message by hundreds of thousands of people saying, not enough and we don't trust you. We're in the streets because if we're not here making demands and, uh, and organizing political movements uh, to demand accountability, then it's not going to happen. And of course, in British Columbia, we've had years now of very significant protests, a lot of them spearheaded by First Nations people against the expansion of the fossil fuel industry. They want to bring two tar sands pipelines to the coast of British Columbia so they can ship the stuff to wherever and sell it in the, in the world market. But the message of New York now uh, is, it's quite a complicated one because, okay, we protested. We were hundreds of thousands of people in the streets of New York and the rulers aren't listening. The people that run the economy of the world and the people that in, in government that serve those economic interests aren't listening. So it's very interesting now. A whole big you know, discussion is opening up about what's the next step. We've had hundreds of thousands of people now in the streets of New York and they're still not listening to us. So what do we do? And I think, you know, this poses very sharply um, the need for the environmental movement to fight for political power. Protesting, great, not enough. Voting, great, not enough. Voter registration, great, not enough. Uh, getting candidates we want, great, but not enough. We have a Congress that is controlled by a party that refuses to believe in climate change officially. 
and where the um, committees are on science are headed by people who are anti-science. Well, I guess you would say over time it has become clear in our efforts to try to work for clean air, clean water, stop polluting, um, we realize that the enemy controls the government. I mean that's the bottom line. Throughout the United States so-called liberal demis um, are all for, you know. Uh, well you have some who are for the Keystone XL tar sands pipeline. And, and they're supposed to be our friends. You have our liberal president who is supporting the TPP, which pretty much is a constitutional, well, the forming of a constitution for international corporations, which will supersede local, state, national, international courts and laws, which will, one factor, would allow corporations to pollute, pollute with impunity watching Obama get into office and saw immediately his doing the bidding of Wall Street killed for me any idea that the Democratic Party could ever be a vehicle for radical justice and environmental justice. The thing that is most telling is that the political system not only is not capable of responding, it does not want to respond because our political system is just, how do you say it? It's only an extension of the economic system. Well, I think environmental activism was born in the struggle to, uh, to contain, if not ultimately stop, the uh, harmful and destructive uh, uh, consequences of our economic system on the environment. Uh, the economic system that we have is proving unable to address the problem and so it's getting worse. So there's a real urgency now to the work that ourselves and uh, of course so many other environmental activists in this continent and in the world are doing. Um, of course there was the big march uh, that was brought in to have leftists to include demis. So the message was somewhat diluted so it wasn't blatantly anti-capitalist. People don't ha are not quite yet at the level of realizing that it's just not addressing a few problems here or a few problems there, that is something inherently systemic. And that means saying the C word, capitalism in the economic military apparatus that supports it, feeds it. There are some good lifestyle changes um, that can be helpful, um, at least for someone's personal health, uh, but the disease is capitalism. I've always been engaged in environmental issues as a socialist for, for 40 years. What's changed in the last 10 and 15 years is just how, um, how urgent it's become. And because it's more urgent, we're looking for the solutions and we're finding, we're understanding even more deeply that this capitalist economic system that we have has a growth imperative to it that uh, can't be curbed and controlled. Capitalism has brought the world to uh, a, a state of grotesque excess. We don't need 80%, 90% of what gets produced and consumed. It's wasteful. But that's capitalism, because capitalism isn't about being in harmony with nature or building a harmonious society. It's about producing things for people to buy so the capitalists can make profit and then continue the cycle. And that's the fundamental contribution that eco-socialists have to make, is, uh, need to make, is to impart an understanding of how this capitalist system has a very powerful growth imperative to it, of expansion. It, it can't stop itself. It can't say, oh, okay, we've gone too far, now cut back. Oh, let's not let's not tear up the Alberta tar sands because that's going to cause all sorts of harm to the environment. It, they can't do it because it's all about profit and growth. I 
I think, you know, we've come to realize in the past 10 and 15 years as eco-socialists is that's a key political battle to, to, to win our allies to, and I call them allies. Everyone who's out there is trying to do something about the environment is a good person doing important stuff, and they're allies. But, um, you know, many are not convinced that the problem is as deep as we think it is. They think it's possible to make some modest or maybe even radical changes, but still we can live with a capitalist system. We just have to make it green, make energy renewable and so on. And no, it's, it's deeper than that. It's this growth imperative. And, and whatever limitations you put on capitalism today, it's going to try and break through tomorrow. So we do have to have the limitations. We should be fighting against uh, pipelines. We should fight against the expansion of oil by rail, all these things. But we'll fight those fights until, you know, we're dead and gone and the next generation carries them on and we're still going to be confronting the fundamental problem. Uh, because even if we win a pipeline battle or two, the, the rate of growth of emissions continues to go. So that's, that's the deep and fundamental contribution that we feel that uh, we have to make as eco-socialists and that we feel is quite urgent. As we spoke earlier, science is telling us that we're in an emergency and we act, have to act on, on that basis. We have to make rapid, profound uh, political change if we're going to bring the economy into um, harmony with, with our natural surroundings. And we're far, far away from that. So, so the science, you know, propels this. The ecological co economy that we need is one that's fully in harmony with what is possible to, um, to extract from the earth and our natural surroundings without compromising future generations. And that requires a, f yeah, a, a radical form of degrowth, but not a form of degrowth that's going to cause people to become more poor. We can make this transition and actually enhance the lives of the vast majority of the people on the planet who in this great capitalist system that supposedly brought us all these wealth live in terrible, miserable conditions. And it's, you know, it's related. We're trashing the environment, but we're also, you know, going more and more deeply into an unequal society, and it's related. Environmental issues, we can only see them in the terms of environmental justice. And that means it has to address racism. And also for them, like for the African American and Latino communities in my city, their kids are growing up in very highly polluted neighborhoods that are underfunded, crime infested, disease infested. I mean, their kids are already marked with toxic waste dump sites, lead poisoning, horrible air conditions, I mean, and poor um, health situations. What are the challenges or what are the difficulties facing us? And I think, um, well, I think it's throughout this country, throughout North America and, and Europe, uh, at least historically, the environmental community in the United States has been predominantly Caucasian. And, and I know it's challenging. It's not easy to reach out to other communities because you get locked into your own battles. But until we see racism as an environmental issue, I've always been interested in building coalitions because it's also building community. We have to see our work that we're building a new society. And that means we have to be able to listen to each other. We have to be willing to see other struggles as our struggles and not just tokenism. And I think for white activists of whatever stripe, we have to face the fact that racism is inseparable from, addressing racism is inseparable from addressing capitalism and, <clears throat> excuse me, and addressing climate annihilation. Probably the most fundamental obstacle is that is at the level of um, ideas and ideology that majority of society is not yet convinced that we have it in our capacity to take control of society and refashion it into um, the, the ecological society that we need. We're brought up in an education and also a political system that um, denigrates our, our, our self-worth, that um, teaches us that you know, we're, not, um, we're not as important as the people with with money and to wear suits. You know, as workers, we don't really have a stake in the system. We're, we're wage slaves. We work for 
uh, a living. We struggle the best we can to have the best wages, the best work conditions, pensions when we're, we get older and retire, uh, education, uh, public education for our children, public health care for all. Um, that's, that's a common interest that, that unites the whole working class. And so, and that, you know, so there's, there's something about you know, the existence of workers under uh, capitalism or you know, we all face common uh, conditions of oppression. But also very importantly, workers possess the skills to transform society. Who, who builds and creates everything? It's not the people with money in the, in the bank towers. They move the money around and they have power. They, have, they control the government, they control the armed forces and the police. So they, they make things happen because they have the power. But they don't actually do anything. They don't, they're, not, they're not the ones that are going to be building the alternative energy systems that we, uh, um, that we have, uh, that rather that we require. They're not the people delivering health care or public education. So, and, and so again, you know, the working class, we actually make society work. And so part of the, the job of, of socialists and eco-socialists and anyone who's progressive is to impart that awareness to people because we're not, we're not educated in the system to be aware of our, of our self-worth, our dignity, and our capacity to run society. So that's a very important uh, uh, thing that has to be won in the working class that, hey, yes, you can run. We can run the world. We have the skills, the interests, and the power to do it. Those people up there moving the money around, they're just, they're an obstacle to what we need to do. So let's push them aside. Let's let them go off and retire in an island somewhere and live their life and let us get on with building a sustainable and, and socially just society. You know, we're making progress this, uh, with this in the world today because people are learning through their life experiences that, um, you know, firstly, this, we can't go on like this. We have to fight regardless because the alternative is, you know, just things things getting worse um, but also people learn that yeah if we do stand together we can improve conditions no one's going to fix it for us except for us you, we have to get it our political leaders aren't going to do it our economic leaders they're not going to do it you go to your neighbors and start saying, what do we do?